This is Talk for More. Today we have chosen an extremely important topic, the protection of the Ukrainian airspace as a security maintenance tool for all Europe. All these and more to talk with your beloved Henry Keane, who is happy to discuss it with experts. Indeed, I would love to express my gratitude to experts and ask some questions. The reality, what is it? My reality, like I'm saving money. I'm trying to earn more. I'm trying to stay healthy. Some people are living in totally different reality, the reality of war. This is our common reality these days. Shahid drones, Iskander and Daga missiles. This is the reality every day of Ukrainians. Living home, they do not know if they will have to spend the day in shelter or if another Russian missile will destroy their plans, or homes, or lives. It has already become a sort of a routine to depend on such external circumstances. It is a new norm in Ukraine, and it is not normal. Ukraine is asking to close its skies, to create a secure umbrella, if you like, so that air defense forces could intercept any threat in any corner of the country. But it's just a Ukrainian dream for now. Today, we will talk more about what kind of a protection system Ukraine already has and what it urgently requires and why. In the first month of the Russian invasion, the Ukrainian air defense forces managed to down Russian missiles at a rate of 20, maybe 30 percent. And that is with old Soviet air defense systems that Ukraine had. The age was not the main issue, however. There were simply not enough of them to close the sky along the entire front line and over large cities deep in the territory of Ukraine. From February to October 2022, Russia launched about 1,200 long-range missiles at Ukraine. Of these, Ukrainian air defense and aviation were able to shoot down 246 cruiser missiles. Well, let's do the math, it's less than 30%. Then from October 2022, Ukraine began to receive modern powerful air defense complexes from Western partners, which is IRISTs and later NISMs, Hawks and Aspides. These systems significantly strengthen the anti-aircraft defense of Ukraine, above all over the Kyiv region. In April this year, Ukraine received the first Patriots. However, before that, Ukraine survived dozens of attacks and real power outages on a scale no civilized country in the world has ever faced. In the winter of last year, Russia came out with another missile terror for Ukraine. The previous heating season was the most difficult in the history of the Ukrainian state ever. No European power system has ever experienced such a large-scale destruction. 43% of trunk networks were completely destroyed or damaged. All thermal and hydroelectric power stations were fired upon and suffered varying degrees of damage. According to the assessment of the World Bank and the United Nations Development Programme, the scale of the destruction of the Ukrainian energy system last year was enormous. Almost $1 billion was necessary just to cover the priority needs of restoring and protecting the Ukrainego power network. Since October of last year, Russia has carried out two, three massive missile attacks every month. During the wintertime, sending 60 to 70 missiles at a time. You still hesitate calling Russia a terrorist state? The main idea of this terror was to confine Ukraine in the dark and cold during the heating season in order to weaken the fortitude and strength of the Ukrainians. That, according to Kremlin plans, supposed to push Kiev's authorities to accept Russian of peace plans on the Kremlin's terms, of course. However, it never happened. The Ukrainians somehow just did not break, while it was really not easy for them. It often happened that people were existing without light for days or even weeks. I was there, to be honest, by that time, and I will never forget it. Like walking 20 floors upstairs using your mobile as a flashlight to find your door enter dark and cold room to have a sandwich and a cold shower and get into cold bed. Do that seven days in a row and you'll get somewhat close to what Ukrainians lived through. It was a luxury if people were given power and light according to schedule for several hours a day to warm up the apartment to do some cooking, I don't know, washing, if you're lucky. During these happy hours, people did their best to charge their gadgets to run household errands. However, most of the day there were no power. However, at the same time, social life has not been paused in hospitals, schools, banks, all that works all right. This is footage of Ukrainian surgeons at the Institute of the Heart performing an operation during the power blackout. 
supplying energy only to the absolutely necessary equipment. And this is teacher from Kiev giving her lesson on the street because apparently that's where she found the network and managed to charge her computer. In total, according to Forbes, as of October 2023, Russia launched more than 3,000 missiles at Ukraine at a cost of $22.8 billion. This is almost half of all the United States military aid to Ukraine since February 24, 2022. Despite the fact that the majority of air attacks in recent months have been carried out not by missiles, but exclusively by UAVs, by October, Russia was still spending about 100 missiles per month at Ukraine. The last month, 31 rocket. The last massive Russian missile attack took place on September 21st, 2023. Then in one day, Russia launched 43 cruise missiles in Ukraine. Today, Ukrainian air defense forces had become strong enough to down almost every Russian missile. A very few Shahid drones also reached their targets. On the night of May 9th, which is a sacrosanct victory day for Russians, remember? Russians launched 25 cruise missiles and Ukrainians shot down 23 of them. That is 92% of shutdown. The day before that, the military reported that all 35 Shahid drones Russian launched at Ukrainian rears were down. On May 1st, 15 out of 18 missiles were shot down on April 20th, 28th. Pardon me, 21st out of 23 missiles. Way to go, Ukraine. Such results were achieved thanks to the new air defense systems that Western partners of Ukraine finally started to deliver for Ukraine. Last autumn, rallies in support of Ukraine were held in many European cities. There were calls heard to increase military aid to the country, in particular to provide Ukraine with anti-aircraft defense systems and other modern means of airspace protection. Activists also drew the attention of the international community to the fact that Iran openly supplies Russia with drones which it then uses to attack Ukraine. From October 2022, Ukraine began to receive modern and quite powerful air defense complexes prior to this. The Allies handed Ukraine several dozen short-range anti-craft systems like Kepard and Stormer. However, the main purpose of this is to counter enemy aircraft and destroy UAVs in a fairly limited area, not at all in anti-missile defense. The first powerful step in strengthening the air defense of Ukraine were the Iris D. NASMs and Aspide complexes. Thanks to these boys' toys, the consequences of winter attacks on critical civilian infrastructure were way less than they could have been. However, there still remains a fairly large number of types of missiles that neither RST nor NASMs are capable of intercepting. These are fast ballistic missiles like KH-22 missile and hypersonic dagger missile. Their speed is from 5 to 10 times higher than the cruise missile speed. To intercept these, air defense systems with a high degree of automation of flight trajectory calculation are urgently necessary. In the spring after the harsh Ukrainian winter 2022-23, finally, Patriots arrived to protect the Ukrainian sky. Patriot air defense systems are considered one of the best air defense systems in the world, and very rightfully so. It is designed to engage medium altitude targets and can shoot down crews and ballistic missiles, aircraft and drones, doing that in large numbers. It was with Patriots' help that the armed forces of Ukraine began to destroy the Russian daggers, which they could not intercept before that. The USA, Germany and the Netherlands delivered one Patriot battery to Ukraine each. Let us resume the past year. Obviously, Ukrainian air defense has made a hyper leap in both the quality and efficiency of its work. If in September 2022, the air defense forces of Ukraine downed about 20-30% of missiles, then already in April-July 2023, the rate was 80-90%. to Still, the Western Patriot and SMPT's systems managed to cover only the most important areas of potential attack, but not the entire sky over Ukraine. While well, the Ukraine's wish list of air defenses has been almost fulfilled, for the country at war, that almost is not enough. This is just not enough. This was clearly stated by the Air Force's spokesperson, Yuri Ignat, during the briefing. 
Ignat notes that Ukraine needs significantly more air defense systems. And just by the way, Ukraine is not just waiting and hoping, the country hopes for joint production of air defense system on its territory. Today, we have received from the Western Allies practically all the air defense that we were promised, one of the best air defense in the world. But the word all here must be divided into the nomenclature of the receipt and the amount. Ukraine requires more air defense systems to protect the sky, says also President Volodymyr Zelensky. And I want to share with you, we don't have air defense. That's why Russia controls the sky. When we will get air defense from our partners, what will be our ammunition? Troops will go, not will go, will run forward. It will be more quicker because we, we can't spend our people. It's not bodies, you know, it's real people. It's humanity. We can't spend it like, like Russia doing. Like, you know, their attitude to their soldiers, like to the meat. I'm so sorry, but we can't do it. That's why we have to move. But if they control all the sky, till those moments when we will get air defense, if they control, we can't move quickly forward. And what, one, the last point, what I want to tell you about the air defense, I'm sorry, just to close this moment. I'm very thankful to President Biden to our European partners, to Chancellor Scholz, and some other, our Nordic partners. They gave us, gave us air defense. And when they gave us, and we, one year ago, we could manage air defense in some cities in our country, now we see the growing economy. This year, 5% growing economy. IMF, World Bank, everybody recognized it. It means that people could come back to Ukraine with their children. They come back from Germany, from Poland, Slovak Republic, because they, they needed too much to come back and have some secure, you know, to have some air defense. So the key is air defense. Yes, the key is air defense, but what is the castle? What kind of air defense? When, how, and what exactly? Let's discuss that with our guest. Jason Smart is with us, American political technologist and political scientist. Hello, Jason. Hello again. Great to see you. Great to see you too. United States support in terms of new budget that will be adopted very soon. What kind of a support Ukraine can expect, do you think? So the U.S. is continuing right now to go through the negotiation process about a national budget that will fund the government for the next mm. fiscal year, which actually started in uh, October. Right. So what we're going to be expecting now is whether or not Ukraine will have a supplemental payment, because it's already been decided that Ukraine will not be part of the full budget. It'll right. be a separate part of that. Okay. And so right now it's a question as to whether or not that will be sent to the Congress, whether or not there'll be a vote on that. And if there is, uh, what that's going to look like. I mean, how much money are we talking about to do what? Uh, and that's still not known. Let's speculate. Sure. I mean, I think that it's more probable that the U.S. would sponsor something like weaponry for Ukraine mm. uh, because it's easier to justify. It's produced in the United States, so the money stays in the U.S., it creates jobs. It's a right. net positive for the U.S. economy. Uh, whereas we're talking about financial support for Ukraine, which the U.S., you know, 40 percent, of the, 40, actually 5 percent of the support or so that the United States is giving to Ukraine is financial. Uh, that is specifically paying for the government salaries in Ukraine and other things due to the huge deficits the government currently is suffering. So firefighters and things like that are de facto being paid by the United States. Uh, and so that is something that there is a lot more resistance to it because it's something that's less tangible. It's money that leaves the country. There's no guarantee that it'll ever come back. Uh, and so it is a big question as to whether or not there will still be support for that. Okay. Um, but what are the main challenges? What are the obstacles in providing support to Ukraine? What, what do you think? These, these, these are uh, only that, maybe more, maybe something that we don't know, don't see. Maybe you see that from the United States. I, I think that the opposition in the United States is diverse as to why there's people opposed to it or where there might be obstacles. And the largest, mm. frankly, is simply that the American public as a whole uh, supports Ukraine far less now than they did before. Uh, both in the Republican and Democratic Party, obviously much stronger in the Republican Party. Uh, but polling numbers indicate there's a reason for that. And the reason is lack of information. Uh, a great deal of Americans simply do not know what is occurring in Ukraine. They're not up to date on the war. 
Uh, and they, you know, they, they don't realize that this is a fight that can be won. Undoubtedly, it can be won. Uh, it just needs more assistance and that this is strategically in the U.S.'s long term interest. So once Americans know that, once they understand how much money we're talking about, 3.5 percent of the U.S. defense budget or yeah, exactly. three tenths yeah. of one Which of is... U.S. budget, they support Ukraine much stronger. Exactly. And, and, a, big, um, and a, a big thank you effort, as my friend likes to say, Stephen Moore. But um, let me ask you, Mike Johnson, the United States Senate Speaker. Well, you know, the Ukrainian media are too fast and maybe too brisky to call someone anti-Ukrainian. I think it is stupid because that actually turns uh, things and people against Ukraine in the end. Um, what would be the wise way to turn Mr. Johnson, if not into... Uh, pro-Ukrainian faith, then at least to put him in a position when it is favorable for him to become more pro-Ukrainian. As a political scientist well, and technologist, can you give, can, can you please educate Ukrainian media, media how to do that? I, I totally agree with you. I, I think it's incredibly unwise to refer to people who don't support aid at this point as being anti-Ukraine. I mean, at that point, why would they want to help Ukraine? Because you've already labeled them as being an enemy. Uh, that's just, it serves no purpose whatsoever. And it's cheap populism that ultimately hurts the country. It'd be far wiser to refer to it as people who, you know, simply don't know yet and need to have it explained to them. People that are skeptical. I mean, you can be skeptical about something and be convinced to the exactly. contrary. Exactly. So right now he is skeptical about the assistance, but that doesn't mean he's against. It means he Absolutely. doesn't really fully understand the logic of it. And we got to help him to understand that. Yeah, well, uh, that's how you make good friends afterwards. If you educate someone, if you will be able to turn your possible enemy, not to enemy, to your friend. That is the wise decision. That's what diplomacy is for, I believe so. And media should help. Well, um, yeah, we have what we have at the moment. But would it be wise to use the narrative like, I don't know, close the sky, people die and something of a sort to make American parliamentarians understand that every day Ukrainian people die because, because of the hesitation? Is that the way? Do you think this is wise? The thing is that uh, at this point, I don't think that's probably the talking points you need. Uh, and the reason is simple, is that Americans are already familiar with the situation in Ukraine. It's been over a year and six months. Uh, wow. At this point, that's something that they're already fully indoctrinated to. And so the reality is when you're trying to persuade somebody, there's a concept called baking in, it's something that's already inside their minds. They've already understood that, and they understand that. And it's not going to convince mm -hmm. them any further, just repeating it. What you need is to present them with new information, different information. So if they understand that there's a link between what is happening in Ukraine and Russia's relationship with Iran, which is also helping to attack Ukraine, but mm -hmm. Iran's also helping to attack Israel. If they understand there's a relationship between those things, it's a positive. If they understand that this is something that is strategically wise and in the interest of Taiwan, right. as well as of the NATO countries, then they understand this in a new way than they currently understand it. Currently, they understand it's an isolated country doing its isolated war. No, right. this is not isolated. It's part of a global structure of what is occurring, and it's definitely in the U.S.'s strategic interest to help Ukraine. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if Mr. Jason Smart in America right now personally heard anything about like Ukrainian investments in their own air defense. Have you heard anything about that? Like Ukrainians are ready I, and, and investing in, in their own military uh, infrastructure. Yes, Ukraine is. And the fact is that the air defense is a, continues to be a very important issue. Mm. And let's be fair, at this point, I think it's actually more important than even it was a year ago. And the reason is simple. A year ago, if we look at the energy sector in Ukraine, uh, there was replacement parts for a lot of the different things that Russia was able to destroy in the energy sector. At this point, obviously, there's just simply less parts than there was before. Why? Uh, where are these parts produced? Well, they're produced in the Soviet Union, which no longer exists, or in Russia, a lot of them, which is uh, not a country that's going to be selling to Ukraine anytime soon. So if there are more attacks, it's actually more dangerous for Ukraine than before. So if the West wants Ukraine to win, a country without energy is going to be impossible. But Ukraine's making the right investment trying to buy this. But the West has to support Ukraine and buy more air defense and sending more air defense now. Because this is going to be much more challenging now than it was before to protect Ukraine from Russia's aerial bombardments. Unfortunately, I think you're right. But let's 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 speculate again. Okay, newest, most modern weaponry, Western weaponry, finally delivered to Ukraine. Russian planes and missiles are shot down faster and in a greater quantity. What diplomatic or political repercussions can be expected in this case in the world, if any? Maybe. This is the way to stop the war, to deliver more weaponry. This is not, not obvious to, uh, to people in the West? I, I fully agree with you. I think that, you know, the greatest mistake in when history writes about this war 
uh, the fact that the White House took so long to make the decision to send weaponry over, hmm. uh, what would go down as one of the greatest errors. I mean, Russia had, uh, I think it was an estimate, 120, 140,000 troops when it initially invaded Ukraine. Uh, today, it has over 400,000 inside of Ukraine. The, the United, they've obviously been able to mine the borders of the front line of the war. Uh, and that mining is going to take time to pick up uh, for Ukraine to be able to advance. But the U.S. has only sent 15 percent of the demining de equipment, which it has promised. So it's always going to slow things down. So, uh, you know, I think it's sort of talking about both sides of their mouths. Uh, and I can say as an American <laughs> that, the, you know, American authorities say, why aren't things moving faster? Uh, is be at the same time saying, but we're not going to give you the tools necessary for you to be able to move faster. So it's a bit unjust and unwise. I think the fastest and the best way that Ukraine can win is by it receiving all the weaponry it needs now and defense uh, technologies so that it can have a decisive victory over Russia. I vote for you as, as American president. I like your Thank program, you. I like your stance. Uh, well, you know, the um, Air Force spokesman, Yuri Ignat, reported that Ukraine will lease a number of air defense systems, but did not name well, the, the countries, nothing more. But I believe this is a fine move, both politically and militarily. Do you agree? Of course. I mean, the fact is, this is something that Ukraine needed to do, and it's good that it's happening. Uh, the more that Ukraine gets in the country now, however it gets in the country now, is important. And the fact that it's leasing, I think, is a wise decision, because one, it doesn't need these weapons in the long term after the war. But secondly, uh, this is something that it shows that there's a buy-in on the side of Ukraine. I think that it's important that Western audiences see that Ukraine is not just the recipient of goodwill, but rather somebody who's purchasing its own uh, uh, ability to defend itself. What do you think is the biggest domestic and what is the, you think, the biggest international problem to solve for the United States of America at the moment? At this point, we are facing an incredibly complicated situation with this axis of countries that are truly evil uh, between Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, and Venezuela. And I think, you know, unfortunately, China is in there, too. And these dictatorships are working together. They're working to unseat democratically elected governments around the world. And they're obviously waging war in the Middle East as they are in Ukraine and what might soon be in Taiwan. Venezuela itself, you know, we don't think about it because it's far away from Ukraine, right. but Venezuela is no. talking about taking over a neighboring country right now. There is a lot going on, and it's a very dangerous world. And it's unfortunately just several small countries plus China that are in charge of all of this. And there should be have done, we should have done much more years ago to Absolutely. stop that and to prevent the rise of Putin's uh, global empire. Well, I just wonder if you um, see it from, from your perspective, from your point of view. Do you think Russia will attack critical infrastructure this winter in Ukraine? I have no doubt that Russia will seek to attack critical infrastructure. And the fact is that it's become much easier than it was before. It's become cheaper. I mean, before it was missile strikes, which are more expensive, more complicated. Uh, but at this point, it seems that Russia is receiving missilery from, from Iran, uh, or mm. it will be shortly. Uh, it's obviously receiving technological assistance from North Korea as well. So before Russia is running out of things like missiles, at this point, they're going to have more. But second to that is that they've advanced dramatically in the past year over right. the use of drones. Right. Drones can be used in so many different ways. And so I, I think this can be yes. increasingly complicated to defend Ukraine. Well, uh, I just wonder, how can you evaluate the progress of the counterattack? Because I hear, I hear voices all the time. Mr. Smart, uh, like Ukrainian counteroffensive is not fast. It's not fast enough. I don't know what's enough for you to sitting on your sofa, but I mean, it's not. But how do you? What do you think? What's the progress for without any air superiority or sometimes without any air at all? Um, any progress for Ukrainian counteroffensive? I mean, we have to remember that the counteroffensive is more than just a line of battle. The counteroffensive is also what's going on in the seas, what's going on in the air, what's going on on the internet, I mean, the cyberspace, uh, as well as space itself. And so there are advances in these areas as well. I mean, is Russia generally more degraded now than it was right. before? And the answer is yes, clearly it is. So if we look at it as a whole thing, a holistic approach to understanding where is the Russian Federation now versus at the beginning of the counteroffensive, Russia is not in a better place. Uh, Ukraine is truly gaining from what is going on right now. And so I think that those who are criticizing counteroffensive, I think they have too much of a, I don't know, uh, idealized view of how warfare works, where, you know, there's just going to storm across the plain and take eastern Ukraine. It historically doesn't really work like that. Uh, historically, you know, you, you get in the, these situations like Ukraine is now, uh, it's less exciting to see, you know, no big breakthroughs, but progress is being made. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's not, I mean, someone, the people are expecting, you know, a Hollywood movie show. 
that well. There's yeah. illusion. He's, he's playing. The, he's the main character, and he just waves the flag. And here we go. Here's the victory. But for some reason, it is not happening. And the reason is the hesitation of the Western world. I believe very much. It is so. But let us speculate even deeper in all that. If all the weapons requested by the leadership of Ukraine, by Ukraine, have been delivered in time, would the results on the counteroffensive have been more successful? Do you think that the war could be over at the moment, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Had the West sent more weaponry to Ukraine faster, undoubtedly Ukraine would have had greater successes at this point. Right. Uh, there is clearly a lack of various types of uh, weaponry, as we all know. Uh, and that's something that continues to drag on and on. And unfortunately, mm. I think that this deadlock in Congress mm -hmm. in regards to financing for Ukraine is something that is certainly not helping. I mean, 96% of funds that were allocated for Ukraine have been used already. 96%. We're down to very little left. Uh, and that's a worrisome sign. And, uh, you know, there's there's not much we could do to influence Congress. You have to sit and wait. Uh, but there, there is something that I think is a lesson learned here, which is the more we drag our feet, the more it costs us both materially as well as time, as well as lives in the long term. The wisest thing we can do is send as much assistance as quickly as possible so that Ukraine can finally right. defeat Russia. Yeah, as well as lives, right. So does the Russian army have enough weapons at the moment? The Russian army seems that it does have sufficient numbers of a lot of the weaponry that it needs. And that being said, I think that Russia is going to suffer from other problems. That it could, well, I mean, it continues to suffer from a lot of problems. And one of those is with personnel. The lack of trained persons that they have in their military is increasing. I mean, it's always been a stable number of people who are they pulled out of prison or out of hospitals uh, or other people who received minimal to no training before being sent off as uh, cannon fodder. Uh, and that's going to continue. Uh, and But that's something that also creates problems because without some sort of a trained uh, uh, soldiery, you're going to continue to deal with people who really don't know what they're doing. There's going to be higher discontent in the military. We see high discontent in the Russian military. Uh, and that is something that I think is actually probably one of the best things going on right now, is the fact that the Russian soldiers themselves are not very happy. And that's something that counts against leadership. Yeah, there are about like 300,000 of them are like dead and, and everyone knows it. But it seems to me that Russian society is getting okay with that. I mean, Whatever. I mean, we're Russians. We're that great enough. We have a great Russian culture. Whatever Dostoevsky Nabokov, we can, you know, have some some sex and have more people. Maybe that is the, that's what they are thinking. And because I, some discontent, yes, but I don't see that really the, the big changes in a Russian society as a as a society that can influence the power that uh, that should influence the power that should have an, an impact, direct impact on the power. Do you believe that some changes in Russia are even possible? after the war, after the Ukraine wins? Well, I mean, ultimately, listen, this war can only end when Russia decides it to end because Russia could continue attacking Ukraine. Even if every soldier of Russia was forced out of Ukraine, Russia could continue to just bomb Ukraine for the next 20 years. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. And as long as it's doing missile strikes regularly on Odessa and, right. and Boris, right. there's no international trade, they're all international traffic dies, and there's going to be no rebuilding the country. So Russia needs to have change, fundamentally, if there's going to be any hope. But I think that will happen. And the reason I think it will happen is not because the Russian population changes, because you're right, they don't change. I agree with you totally. But they don't really matter. Because as we know, in Russian history, the people, the peasants, the serfs, have never really mattered to the Tsar. What's yeah, going to actually yeah, matter yeah. and what right. changes things is when there's a military coup, for instance. And when we look at what happened in Rostov with Prigozhin, uh, this was a huge step in that direction. We see that there's a significant instability. Look at the head of the military of India, uh, one of the largest militaries in the world. What do you say? He said that we no longer view Russia be a strategic partner because what we saw go on with Prigozhin showed that there's too much insubordination and instability of the Russian military in the Russian state. Uh, we look at the senior leadership of the Russian government when Prigozhin did that. The ministers, even Patriarch Kirill, <clears throat> you look at what was going on with the officers that he encountered in Rostov, nobody confronted him. And the reason is simple. They weren't sure if he might win. So we see there is political instability in the Russian government. And when we talk about the mass of soldiers, I agree. I mean, what they think or think do not think doesn't really matter. But the day that they try to seize power, uh, which could happen, or just not obey their officers or kill their right. officers, right. Uh, which has happened before in Russian history, then this would be something that could be a, a significant shift into what is occurring. Okay, well, shift happens what well, shift happens that sounds good right shift happened so um someone else not Putin. what else uh so you know it's gonna be really hard it depends but it'll probably be someone from the oligarchical class we could assume it will not be someone i think in the close political leadership i mean someone like a shogu who's completely reliant on putin as his patron would right. i mean i think be i mean he'll end up dead pretty quick uh, and so will a lot of the other people. But whoever it is that comes to power, uh, I'm pretty sure it would end the war quickly. And the reason is very simple. 
if you come to power illegitimately, illegitimately, sorry, uh, the biggest problem you're going to face is that people do not recognize you as the actual leader of the country. So the way you get around that is to gain legitimacy. And the way you gain legitimacy, there's several ways, but one of the ways is you gain international recognition. And to gain international recognition from the West, especially from the United States, uh, controlling the nuclear arsenal is probably the most important thing. And the second most important thing is probably that you are able to uh, uh, assure the West that you're not going to be a threat to them any longer. And that includes pulling out of Ukraine. And I think any oligarch who were to come to power values his money and his power more than he values a distant war in Ukraine and would probably be willing to make that deal. Thank you very much, Mr. Smart. It was a pleasure to talk to you, as always. Thank you very much for your time and expertise. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Watch this. I wonder if the high chairs European politicians would actually live in a position of every day fearing the missile attack. Would this air defense systems to be delivered in Ukraine faster? As a result of a Russian missile attack on the night of November 6th in Odessa, the building of the Odessa Art Museum, which was located in the zone of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, was badly damaged. The missile hit the road right in front of the museum. On that day, the museum planned to celebrate its 124th anniversary with a present from Russia with hate. Let us ask artificial intelligence. What specific measures can be taken to ensure the protection of airspace of the country from possible enemy attacks? To ensure the protection of airspace from possible enemy attacks, several specific measures can be taken. Radar systems, deploying advanced radar systems to detect and track any unauthorized aircraft or drones entering the airspace. These systems provide early warning of potential threats. Air defense systems, employing air defense systems, such as surface-to-air missiles and anti-aircraft guns, to intercept and neutralize hostile aircraft or missiles. Aerial surveillance, utilizing aerial surveillance platforms like drones or aircraft for continuous monitoring of the airspace, enabling rapid response to potential threats. Communication and command centers, establishing well-equipped communication and command centers to coordinate response efforts and manage airspace security. Collaboration with intelligence agencies, cooperating with intelligence agencies to gather information on potential threats and identify hostile intentions. No-fly zones, designating no-fly zones over critical areas and infrastructure, and enforcing strict regulations to prevent unauthorized access. Counter UAS technologies, implementing counter unmanned aircraft systems that can detect and disable hostile drones and other unmanned aerial systems. Deep strikes, conducting deep strikes against hostile logistics and supply lines to disrupt enemy air operations and reduce their ability to launch attacks. Vulnerability assessments, regularly assessing the vulnerabilities in the airspace defense system and adapting security measures accordingly. Satellite security, ensuring the security of satellite data that plays a crucial role in modern combat and defense operations. These measures, when implemented effectively, help safeguard airspace from potential enemy attacks and maintain national security. As easy as that, right? September 2023 was a record year, bad record year, for the number of shahid type kamikaze attack drones launched at Ukraine. According to analysts, during the month, Russia released over 500 drones at Ukraine. This is much more than in May. However, the number of cruise missiles launched by Russia towards Ukrainian cities has decreased. Such a situation has the obvious explanation. Moscow is stockpiling missiles for future strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure during fall winter 2023. How many missiles does Russia have that it can fire at Ukrainian cities again? Unfortunately, we all are about to learn that shortly. During the past cold days, Russia launched approximately 900 long-range missiles at Ukraine. At that time, Kyiv believed that Russian missiles would simply run out because the reserves are not unlimited, you know, and spare parts for the production of new ones are nowhere to be found. Because there are sanctions, etc. etc. However, from May to August, the Russian occupiers fired about 600 more rockets than expected. Where did they come from? I did say that some loopholes in some sanctions are even bigger than sanctions themselves. The answer to that was given to Politico, reported that Russia was able to reach pre-war rates of production of high-precision weaponry. This happened in spite of Western sanctions, which the aggressor state learned to bypass thanks to grey schemes. The microchips and other high-tech components necessary for missile assembling continued to be supplied through third countries. 
Let us somewhat analyze the data of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine regarding the stocks and production of Russian missiles in January 2023. In the first year of the Great War, we clearly see Russia produced an average of about 50, 60 long-range missiles per month. According to the latest estimates of the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine, however, Russia has increased production in 2023 up to 100 missiles per month. I love to ask one more question, a quick one for my artificial assistant. What international communities or agreements exist for joint airspace protection? There are several international communities and agreements that exist for joint airspace protection. These agreements aim to ensure the safe and orderly use of airspace and protect the sovereignty of states over their airspace. Here are some key agreements and communities. Convention on International Civil Aviation. This convention establishes the fundamental principles of international air law, emphasizing that every state has complete and exclusive sovereignty over the airspace above its territory. It provides the framework for international cooperation in civil aviation and airspace management. International Civil Aviation Organization, this is a specialized agency of the United Nations responsible for developing and maintaining international standards for aviation, including safety and security measures. It plays a crucial role in coordinating efforts for airspace protection and safety. Common Aviation Area Agreements, agreements like the Common Aviation Area Agreement between the European Union, its member states, and Ukraine aim to create a common aviation area, harmonizing regulations and standards for airspace management and protection. These agreements and organizations work collectively to promote the safe and secure use of airspace while respecting the sovereignty of individual states. They play a crucial role in ensuring international peace, order, and cooperation in aviation and airspace protection. Right, I wonder why these agreements are just not working with Russia, but nevertheless. F-16 fighters are another urgent necessity for Ukrainian skies, like an old necessity, voiced almost over a year ago. The American F-16 is one of the most technically complex and advanced types of military equipment that Ukraine can get, finally. Last year, the transfer of F-16 fighters jets to Ukraine looked like a very, very distant prospect, if any real at all. At the beginning of 2023, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Mitro Kuleba, openly stated that, after reaching an agreement on the transfer of Leopard tanks, the next step will be F-16 fighter jets. Then key decisions were made in May 2023. U.S. President Joe Biden approved the training of Ukrainian pilots on the F-16s and a few days later, at the 12th meeting of Ukrainian allies in the Ramstein format, a decision was made to create an air coalition to train Ukrainian pilots. On July 11, 2023, the NATO summit in Vilnius, 11 countries and Ukraine signed a memorandum on the creation of such a coalition, a true and clear success of Ukrainian foreign policy. The trips of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to the Netherlands and Denmark on August 19, 20th ended with a resounding victory. The leaders of the countries announced that F-16 fighters will be delivered to the armed forces of Ukraine. At that time, Zelensky announced as much as more than 60 aircraft would gradually be handed over to Ukraine. However, they will not start arriving in Ukraine before the new year after pilot's training. Regarding the training, Five Dutch F-16 fighters arrived from the Netherlands to Romania, and Ukrainian pilots are trained on them right now. A training center for Ukrainian and Romanian pilots will soon be opened at the Fitesti Air Base. As I already mentioned, Ukraine began asking Western partners for fighter jets even before the summer counteroffensive campaign. These machines could and should actually have become the driving force of events at the front. I mean, counter-offensive. Now, F-16 fighters will be way less useful for Ukraine. This was stated by the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Valery Zaluzhny. In any interview with Economist, published on November 1st, Zaluzhny also noticed that the Russian Federation also improved its anti-aircraft defense during this time, of course. According to him, Western allies were way too careful to supply Ukraine with their latest technologies and powerful weapons, fearing confrontation with Russia. I wonder where we are right now. Let us discuss these boys' toys with someone who is an expert in this kind of things. Ivan Stupak is with us tonight, military analyst, former SSEU, which is Security Service of Ukraine. Hello, Ivan. Hello, nice to see you. Nice to see you back. Um, help me to understand. What are the pros and cons, the advantages and 
possible limitations associated with the potential purchase or delivery for like of F-16s aircraft to Ukraine. What I'm trying to ask, is it good and useful for Ukraine or already not so much? Uh, we still believe it's uh, very necessary and it's very important for Ukraine, but our chief in commander, Valer Zaluzhny, right. he thinks uh, that now maybe it's not be uh, F-16 will, will not be a game changer. Yeah, it's very important, but not so game changer. So what about pros and cons? Uh, on from one side, it's a pretty expensive toy, really expensive. Oh, yeah. Uh, it starts. It starts from, if my memory serves me well, it's about thirty million dollars per unit. So, it's quite expensive. Uh, but on the other side, it's a mass product. So, totally in general, according to official reports, uh, we are producing about four thousand four thousand items or pieces of uh, F sixteen in different. Uh, modifications. So it's a mass product. Okay, we understand it. But also the third, third hand is is um, equipment. I mean missiles. Mm. What type of missiles could uh, could wait Ukraine from our allies, uh, or what types of missiles could Ukraine buy by him by itself? So the range is uh, pretty uh, pretty wide, from fifty thousand uh, dollars per uh, one missile up to one million or maybe two, two almost two million dollars right, right, right. for more modern modern uh, models. You said the F-16s will not be the game changers at the moment. I can understand that. Well, I can understand why, because of the fortifications that the Russians were able to build at this time while the world was hesitating and asking questions instead of acting. But maybe you can guess, or let, let us speculate, what is the game changer then, if not F-16s? Nuke? Nuke weapon? Okay, okay, I'm just joking, okay, okay. Uh... In my opinion, game changer may be could could be uh, several uh, pieces of uh, weapon, modern weapon. For example, it could be um, combat helicopters. I mean, uh, modern maybe Huey, maybe Apache, maybe. But it's also very expensive. Yeah, uh, it could be uh, also Atakams uh, missiles without range, about. 300 kilometers, I mean in quantity, not 20 pieces, but maybe uh, 200 pieces. Oh, it's 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 good one. 200 pieces is good one for us. Yes. What else? What else? What else? It could be mm, tanks, a lot of tanks, but it should be deployed not one by one, but uh, pretty much bunches. I mean, uh, 20 at one time, at 30 at one time, so... In my, uh, I think I think it's this way. The quantity. Okay, we're getting back to aircrafts. How many fighting aircrafts? Let's let's say just any fighting aircrafts. Does Ukraine need now? So that could really affect the course of what's going on on the front line, the course of hostilities. I think at least one hundred. At least uh, I, I will explain why. Uh, F-16, it's not a UFO. It's not a something like a spaceship with the lasers. It's a, it's a piece of iron. Yeah, it's a, it's a technique. It's a mechanic. It always could be broken. It always could be hit down, shut down by uh, Russian artillery or Russian um, anti-aircraft systems. So we need to have in uh, to, to replace uh, damages pieces. So at least we need 100, at least. In good condition, maybe 200, maybe 300, because uh, Russian federations, Russian Federation got about, they got about more than 200, maybe up to 500 different types of aircrafts. So, uh, and also we need at least 100 highly trained and highly motivated pilots. But now it's uh, uh, it's impossible. We've got only about ten, maybe fifteen pilots. Well, the motivation, I believe, is not a problem for Ukraine. The the 
Um, they need to go through the training program. That is for sure. But I'm, I'm I, sure. I, I, will, I will explain why 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 I'm talking yes, about the motivation. Be because uh, it's not uh, just a, a problem to uh, teach how to, op to to operate uh, F16. You have to teach uh, for a first side for a first step is uh, to increase to advance your English level. Uh, to be able to understand, oh, oh, what, 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 what is it? Yeah, oh, wow, 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 is this, oh, what is? So to understand what you have to switch on, to switch off, to to pull, to uh, to move. Uh, this is uh, to put. This is to move. So to understand, uh, it's uh, it takes maybe four or four months, maybe six months of right. intensive uh, learning. So it's motivation because we understand some type of, of pilot. Oh, I don't want. Oh, six months of English. Nah, really? I will stay with oh, come Mick on, twenty nine. Man, maybe, maybe. No, no, no. I, I, I would like to be uh, realistic. Yeah, we have a lot of pilots with highly motivated, highly motivated, but not everyone. Not totally one hundred percent. Also concerns also uh, our mm, special services. I I know such types of guys. Who are just thinking when 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 I have to retire? Wow, it's in two years. Ah, right. I, I'm I'm tired. So I don't know. We have such type of guys. Sorry. Well, anyone has these type of guys. Try, trust trust me. I've seen these guys in America. I've seen these guys in Germany. I've seen them all around the world. This is the type of people. Well, let us back to the aircraft. You said that this is this is a quite expensive piece of metal. Yes, and this piece of metal quite expensive, needs a quite expensive, pardon me, infrastructure. And infrastructure yes. is the key. So do you believe that at what stage is the preparation of the necessary infrastructure in Ukraine now? This is my question. Oh, so yeah, that's a uh, good question. Also, we need a, a highly trained uh, ground crew. So pilots, it's okay, good pilot. But what about ground crew? Uh, yeah. The guys who are able to repair in short uh, period of time uh, these uh, combat jets. Uh, so they also the preparations, their training, are uh, very important for um, for Ukraine. Also, well, you're just talking about uh, talking about. Uh, Ground facilities. Ground so facilities, it's all right. the, That's right. Uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, as a component of F-16 security. So we understand that Russian Federation intelligence uh, were concerned about and Russian uh, general staff also concerned about F-16, and they are trying to reach out. Okay, where 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 Ukraine will be able to. Uh, deploy uh, bases, uh, based bases with uh, such type of uh, aircraft. So uh, we, you Russians, would like to hit it with our uh, drones, with our ballistic missiles, with mm -hmm. cruise missiles. So Ukraine uh, authorities uh, need to make make a lot of preparations to right. hide uh, this uh, technique from mm, from. From in, uh, from Russian intelligence eyes, so it could be just it's just my opinion. Western part of Ukraine, uh, maybe Carpathian Mountains, maybe it could be some underground uh, or deeply um, uh, drilled in the uh, mountains uh, special facilities. Oh, likewise in Iran. Do you remember these footages when Iranian aircraft uh, are stored in some mountains, hidden places? I do, uh, I do, which yes. Is not, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, and these places uh, could not be destroyed with any type of uh, ballistic missiles. Okay, infrastructure, that's one thing. The maintenance is the other thing. So as far as I understand, each F-16 has to be maintained after each flight. So how does Ukraine yeah. plan on to, to provide such a maintenance and tech support for F-16s alone as a country or maybe in an in, in alliance, in a partnership? But that would be easier. It's just, just a thought. Uh, look, uh, it just, we just were talking about the ground crew. So it's uh, as a type of specialist who should be prepared and trained to uh, maintain uh, this, such, such type of uh, technique. So uh, I think here we wouldn't met with some problems. So 
the main problem is for me is uh, pilots and uh, ground facilities. So yes. ground crew, okay, it's also a problem, but it's not so big, not so huge. Okay. All right. Um, tanks, let's say tanks are delivered to Ukraine. F-16s are delivered to Ukraine. Whatever Ukraine likes is delivered to Ukraine. To what extent does all this military aid serve as a, I don't know, shield, a deterrent against further aggression from Russia? Maybe this is the answer. This is how to end the war. No, it's just a temporary shield. Okay, uh, because we should be, we should rely only or you know, should rely on our internal production. Uh, right. Just our missiles, rockets, uh, tanks, artillery, anti-aircraft systems. So Great. the great main main idea is not to uh, not to be in a um, standby position. Oh, okay, everything is okay. We should uh, every day think and work really work. It's not a um, uh, loud words. Uh, to work on our defense uh, in different spheres. Uh, also, as I said, artillery, tanks, uh, shell productions, also uh, munition for light armor. Now in Ukraine, we don't have a um, production for light armor uh, production. So it, it's nonsense. Thank you. Um, so the when the situation is changing on the front line, everything is changing with the military aid. Like, I remember Kherson, I remember Kharkov coming back to Ukraine. And the military aid that were not discussed before that was almost ready after that. So how is the nature of military aid is evolving now? What is the world thinking? Is the world ready finally to give these F-16s enough for Ukraine? And other equipment, I mean, all okay. the military equipment that, that is necessary. Uh, okay. In... Uh couple of words in a nutshell yeah, okay sure. uh, as as um, our european okay as our western allies said uh the quotation our cupboards are almost bare so we have to understand it because as long war is takes uh, the more depleted uh storages of munition in the western countries because they were not ready for such a long and so bloody war as it takes in ukraine as it takes place so um, it's also another big challenge for Euro european union for united states for united states it's okay because uh, as i uh, read um uh, one of the report that um how it's called, uh, not, not Nostrum Grumman House, Lockheed, oh, Lockheed Martin Com Corporation, it increased its, yeah, it increased its uh, sales and its profits up to 25%, up to 25% because military production is very important, not just only for Ukraine, also for Germany, for uh, United Kingdom, for Australia, Absolutely. and for uh, uh, different, different countries in the world. So it, should take some time to increase the level of production, but Ukraine doesn't have such a lot of time. Okay, I'll take that as an answer, but what diplomatic efforts are taken by Ukraine to receive what it urgently needs? How about diplomacy in this uh, case? As far as I know, our diplomacy works uh, all around the world, uh, trying to convince our allies to continue to support Ukraine, not only with munition, uh, but also with diplomatic support right. and also with uh, finance support. It's very important. I have to, to make it clear because for your viewers, because Ukraine, the Ukrainian budget is uh, virtually divided, uh, divided on a half. So one half is what we are earning inside Ukraine, uh, right. and other part, and, and the first part we are using uh, to finance our military procurements, uh, to finance our to to play to pay salary for our right. uh, servicemen, and the other part is what we got from European Union, from its the funds, funds yes. from United States, from from United mm. States, and we use it to pay salary for civil service uh, to repair roads. So we need this money extremely. So yeah, uh, one of the 
task, main task of our diplomacy, to continue to persuade, uh, to convince our suppliers to continue this support, not to cut funds for Ukraine. Right. Um, Ivan, do you believe Russia will attack critical civilian infrastructure in Ukraine this winter? To be honest with you, I will I will be very surprised if uh, Russia won't do it. So <laughs> why? <laughs> Last year, your uh, <clears throat> Russian Federation done it from uh, October till late of March. So uh, yeah. about maybe maybe, maybe uh, almost five months, almost half a year. So and now I I think I do believe they are just waiting for extremely cold uh, weather outside in order to. Uh, severely damage uh, Ukrainian infrastructure. But now in Kyiv, it's about, uh, about 10 degrees, maybe. For yesterday, it was, for a day before yesterday, it was 15 uh, uh, degrees, and we've got shiny sun, so it's not very good weather for uh, Russian uh, military to attack our infrastructure. Well, maybe as a special service officer, maybe in person, have you met yeah. just those ordinary Russians that are aware that um, Putin and the Kremlin are um, shelling every winter the civilian infrastructure, the cities at night, trying to freeze the whole nation. How do they connect that to their greatness of Russian culture and everything? Just a question between F-16s and tanks. Maybe you have an answer. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have an answer because uh, time to time I try to read some Russian publics. It's not a pleasure for me. It's not giving me a lot of pleasure, but just to understand okay. what is going on. Yes. And you know, they're extremely happy. Ah, oh, Ukrainians, you are now going to Stone Age. Ah, how is to be without Wi-Fi, without electricity, without central heat heating supply? So... They're just extremely happy of such type of activities from so Russia. Are you telling uh, me that they are they are surprised that Ukrainians are still alive? They would love the, uh, that 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 type of a behavior of the Kremlin to continue. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. They are waiting because look, um, um, when Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian critical infrastructure is damaged so uh, hard, they mm. got some feelings of uh, supremacy. Ah, we, are, we can do it. We can do it. Yeah. So they, they doesn't have any uh, victories on the battlefield, but they got some uh, victories on battlefield, battlefield uh, struggling with Ukrainian civil infrastructure. So oh, this is, this is very, a kind of, they've got satisfaction. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's what I wanted to say. I mean, this is a kind of satisfactory. If you cannot invent your own car for more than 75 years, then maybe this is the way you just bombard, you just sell the innocent civilians. If that would be Ivan for you to decide, um, what would you do to change the course of the war now? Whatever it is, political, economical, military, uh, uh, militarily um, vectored decision, such as that. So, as for, okay, as for me, uh, we should uh, reduce our military plans. I will explain mm. why. Okay, Great. now in Ukraine, yes. we've got only one plan. Okay, we should reach um, borders of, of Ukraine in 1991 year, yeah, or so. So Crimea, Donetsk, Lugansk, etc. So I, I understand that for our um, Western allies, it's not so clear. Oh, it's too long. It's, it could take uh, 50 years. Maybe it could take uh, more than 200 uh, diet soldiers from Ukrainian side. It could take hundreds of billions of dollars. So, so it, it's very expensive. It's very long. So in case if we will reduce our... Uh, primary targets from big one to smaller. For example, sure, our sure. small target is to reach Crimea Peninsula, not to enter uh, Crimea Peninsula, not to start battle for Crimea, just to reach it, for example, uh, the city is named Armensk. So, right. just, it's one, 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 one step. Uh, so, step by step. First, to reach Crimea. Second, to, uh, to get, uh, to reach our borders, uh, no, to reach out situation maybe 
uh, of two, uh, February 2022. So if we will divide our priorities on small stages, it could be more more clear and maybe more acceptable for some in White House, some guys in White House, maybe in uh, down the street and etc. More visible, more clear at least the short term. Yes, yes, short term. Yes, yes. Well, um, yeah, there is um, there is a very um, very b big wisdom in this uh, small step uh, path. I, I see that, Ivan. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to Thank talk you so to much. you, and I hope to talk Thank to you soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you so very much for your time, for your expertise. But the questions are just too many. Well, one thing is obvious. The air defense of Ukraine is an important component of the country's national security and defense system. That much is obvious. Also, it is obvious that Russian Tsar will not stop until stopped. Until Ukrainian skies are fully protected, the war will continue not only in the east of the country, but everywhere in Ukraine. And Ukrainians will live from air alert to air alert, moving from shelter to shelter, doing their best to survive, while the world is counting risks, money, and possible profits. Please, think about that when you will turn your computer off. Meanwhile, stay safe and have a great day.